From WAMU 88.5 at American University in Washington, welcome to the Kojo Nam, the show connecting your neighborhood with the world. It's Tech Tuesday. Ellen Stolfen grew up around science. Her father was a rocket engineer and her mother a science teacher. But the body of expertise she started to build in the days that science surrounded her family now extends to places no human has ever traveled. Other planets, other moons. She's now the chief scientist at NASA, an organization that today is collecting information from the other side of our solar system with a spacecraft flying past Pluto more than 3 billion miles away. She joins us in studio to explore her role in shaping the scientific agenda at NASA and her mission to help science capture the attention and imagination of Americans everywhere. Ellen Stofen, Chief Scientist at NASA, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. This is a big day for science. The New Horizons mission launched in January 2006, and after nine years of making its way across the solar system, spacecraft flew by Pluto today. What are you hoping to learn from this? You know, Pluto is such an unexplored world, and I have to say, you really have to step back and think about what an accomplishment this is today. In 1962, we flew, NASA flew the Mariner 2 spacecraft past Venus. That started our reconnaissance of the solar system that actually has come to an end today. So Pluto was the last unexplored body in our solar system. It took us from 1962 all the way. 53 years. Yeah, really long time. So such an exciting day for us. So when you go to a new planetary body, you know, you have some notions based on scientific theory, what you might expect. Is it going to be covered with impact craters saying that the surface is very old and not active. Is the surface going to have complex geology which tells you the planet is still alive? And so frankly the theories kind of ranged all over the place for Pluto because it was so far away, so unknown. We had images from Hubble but frankly they're kind of blurry little pixels and you really can't tell much of anything. And so the anticipation for, for today has just been huge. It's my understanding that you have already learned that Pluto is not quite as dwarfish as some thought. What information did we gather before the flyby? You know, as we've approached Pluto, we've gotten a series of better and better resolution images. So right away we started seeing, okay, the surface is pretty complex. There are bright and dark areas. There are smooth areas. There are rough areas. Right there, that's telling you there's active geology. So all the geologists, of which I am yes. one, start getting really excited. So that was the first thing that we started learning bef before uh, before we got there. The other thing we learned is is Pluto's exact diameter, which is about uh, 1,470 miles. So it's it's quite a diminutive little thing, I must say. It's it's smaller than our own moon, um, but still active geologically, which is from a geologic point of view is really interesting because you say with such a small body, what is driving those geologic processes? Of course, the important question, are you on Team Pluto? Do you think <laughs> it should be considered a planet? You know, <laughs> when, it first, when they first uh, reclassified it as a dwarf planet, um, I, I was sort of like, oh, w what was the point? You know, we all have memorized, all of us memorized Pluto as a planet coming forward. But I must say, as time gone, has gone on, it's just seemed so unimportant to me, especially as we've, um, with other NASA spacecraft, the Dawn spacecraft right now, which has been observing Ceres and Vesta, which are two other dwarf planets. Um, the problem is we found out over time there are many, many of these smaller planets. And I'm, when I go talk to school kids, I always joke with them because kids love this. You know, that to them, this <laughs> this idea, this controversy, and the, I think they love the underdog. So poor Pluto <laughs> with exactly right. emotion, and they're so stressed out about it. And I always say to them, look at it this way. Do you want to memorize eight planets, or do you want to memorize like 15 with new ones always being added? So they laugh. Our guest is Ellen Stofen. She is Chief Scientist at NASA. If you have questions or comments for her, give us a call at 800-433-8850. What questions do you have about today's flyby of Pluto? You can also go to our website, kojoshow.org, watch our live video stream there, or ask questions or make comments. Or you can send us a tweet at Kojo Show or email to kojo at wamu.org. What kinds of instruments are on board the New Horizons craft? I read about one called the Student Dust Counter which measures the density of dust in the outer solar system. What significance does dust have? What does it tell us about our system? Well, New Horizons has a variety of instruments all trained on different understanding different aspects of Pluto and its five moons. 
Um, and so certainly we have cameras that are looking at different parts of the spectra, so infrared uh, cameras, ultraviolet, that help you understand the composition, uh, what the surfaces are made of on Pluto and its moons. The dust counter is a really exciting student experiment. First of all, it was built by students, great opportunity for students at um, UC Boulder to uh, put that, that instrument together. But Pluto is actually kind of a dusty place to the point actually as we fly the New Horizons spacecraft this morning or as we flew it this morning uh, in between uh, Pluto and Sharon as we went zipping by, um, we actually worry about dust Im impacting the spacecraft a little bit. Um, there's a lot of impacts. There's a lot of objects in the Kuiper Belt. They're far apart, but still they do impact each other. And so understanding the density of dust out there, what kind of dust is out there is, is actually something that's quite important. We also have instruments on, on uh, New Horizons that are also looking at the effect of the solar wind. Uh, you know, the wind produce, the, su the sun produces streams of particles from its surface that we call the solar wind. They impact Earth. It's what causes auroras here on, on Earth. Uh, it certainly impacts our spacecraft out at Mars. It's our first time to really try to understand what's going on with the effects of, of that wave coming out from the sun so far out in the solar system. So that's another experiment on New Horizons we're looking forward to. Half a century ago, the Mariner probe flew by Mars. Now a spacecraft is flying by Pluto for the very first time. You grew up around so much of this science while your father worked on rockets for NASA, even before the organization was called NASA. Yeah. <laughs> What place did Pluto hold in your imagination back when you were a child growing up? You know, to me, P Pluto was always just this completely intangible, exotic place because, you know, out beyond the gas giants, you know, to me, my imagination always got sort of stuck at Saturn, which is one of my favorite planets, um, because, you know, those beautiful rings and, and the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune are so dramatic. Uh, and with the Voyager encounters that were going on, uh, the two Voyager spacecraft that threw, uh, flew by those planets in the 1980s, Pluto was always this kind of leftover, far away little object. And uh, for me, since I study solid planets, I study volcanoes on Venus, Mars, one of the moons of Saturn called Titan. Um, you know, Pluto is just this thing, like, what is it? What is it made of? What does it look like? Is it going to be boring and covered with craters? Sorry for people who love the moon and Mercury. Um, or is it going to have complex geology that I like, like volcanoes and tectonics? And I, I'm thinking it's more towards what I was hoping. You took a different path from your father. You, as you just pointed out, are a planetary geologist. What drew you to this corner of the science? You know, I must say, I was one of those kids who always picked up rocks. I had rocks all over my room, and it's to the point, honestly, that my husband always says, do we have to have rocks in every room of the house? <laughs> yes, to throw it to you if you get <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <Go> ahead. <laughs> um, and so at some point, I guess when I was uh, 11 or 12, my mother was getting a master's degree in education, and she had to take a geology course as her sort of science uh, course. And uh, I went with her on the field trip and was fascinated you know, people get paid for this. You know, they get to go wander around outside and pick up rocks. And this is like a job. This is so exciting. Uh, so to me, it was such a great field to go into. And, and around the same time period, my father worked on the uh, rockets that launched the two Viking spacecraft mm -hmm. to Mars. And I went down to the launches and I heard people like Carl Sagan uh, talking about why we explore Mars. And, you know, here it was, rocks, space, the two combined, and I was pretty much sold, and I was going to become a planetary geologist, and that's what I did. Rest, as they say, is history. You've said that a lot of your life has been about discovering what we can understand about our own planet here by looking at other places in space. How does that shape what we're observing with this flyby today? You know, when you look at any planet, and I always say it's not so much about when we go out into the solar system, we're gathering all this information that we turn around and look look back at the Earth. So when you look at a place like Pluto, you're saying, what are the processes going on inside the planet? Things like heat that are producing um, surface movements, what we call tectonics or volcanoes, um, versus things that are happening from the outside of a planet, impact craters or weather. For example, it gets so cold on Pluto that its atmosphere actually snows out onto its surface. Those are versions of those processes are occurring on every planet in the solar system. So if we really want to understand the Earth, understand what is the real physics behind the processes that shape our planet, by having other planets to compare it to where the conditions are different, I always say it's like how, with a doctor, you have, if you only had one patient to study, you wouldn't ever learn a lot about the progression of disease. Well, for a planetary geologist, if we really want to understand the Earth, having these other exotic and interesting planets to compare to our own, 
helps us understand this planet better. 800-433-8850. What questions do you have about NASA's plans for future discoveries? Or go to our website, kojoshow.org. Watch the live video stream there. Participate in the conversation. Let's go to Dave in Annapolis, Maryland. Dave, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, the question that I've always had about uh, uh, spacecraft that go out is, I can barely get Wi-Fi in my house, and sometimes people tell me they drop text messages. How in the world do you get images and data back from that far away? And I'll listen on, on air. Thank you very much. You know, we have this amazing thing called the Deep Space Network, which is um, uh, basically three different antenna sites around the world, because obviously as the Earth rotates, you need, and you're talking out into space, you need to send every face of the Earth towards, towards your spacecraft. So we have antenna in California, uh, in Madrid, uh, outside of Madrid, and uh, outside of Canberra, Australia. And those antennas make up the Deep Space Network. So we point our dishes um, in the direction. We'll be doing that tonight, starting, uh, I think, around 8 o'clock. We'll start pointing our, our antenna um, towards Pluto. Obviously, we know where Pluto is in the sky. Uh, sometime around uh, four hours earlier than that, because it takes four and a half hours to get the signal um, on the Earth from Pluto. So about four and a half hours before that, the New Horizons spacecraft would have turned towards Earth, and it figures out where the Earth is by looking at the stars, understanding where the sun is. It figures out where the Earth is, and it just starts shouting towards the Earth, I'm okay, I made it through the Pluto system, <laughs> more or less, that's what it says. Um, and so then we receive that signal at our big dishes, the two um, spacecraft, the spacecraft locks up on the on the the carrier stream coming from the, the antenna. They lock... Uh, um, they lock up together, which is that's that phrase, you lose lock. It's because that's um, when you lose uh, conversation between the spacecraft and an, uh, and an antenna. And it sends all those bits back, and we turn that into, uh, into beautiful images like the one that was released this morning. Fascinating. Here now is Dan in McLean, Virginia. Dan, your turn. Hello, good afternoon. I wanted to ask, your guest, Kojo, about, I consider myself an advocate for exploring um, space colonization, yes. and I think there's been a real interest in that. You know, Andy Weir's book, The Martian, um, combined with all the publicity around the New Horizon mission, it's really exciting. I wanted to ask your guest what she thinks of uh, the impact that this mission has on our, basically, uh, pursuit of space colonization. Um, whether it's through a federal program or just the public conception of that. Thanks so much. You know, I think it's so much of our, our human nature to move outward into the solar system, whether we do it robotically um, to places like Pluto that are, um, you know, it took us nine and a half years to get there with the New Horizon spacecraft, so people aren't going there anytime soon, to places like Mars, where uh, Right now, the president has a plan uh, to get humans um, in the Mars vicinity in the 2030s, and at NASA, we're working hard to make that happen. Uh, we are working on a new rocket, the Space Launch System, uh, that will launch us from the Earth, the Orion capsule, which will sit on top of it to get humans out at least to the vicinity of the moon, and then we're working on the technologies that we need uh, to actually land people on the surface of Mars, which is quite, a, quite an undertaking. I think it's critical for for humans to move out beyond this planet. And frankly, for me, I look at it from a scientific point of view. We think that life evolved is likely to have evolved at some point in the past on Mars. And, and I have a bias that it's going to take field geologists like me, uh, astrobiologists on the surface of Mars, to really analyze, did that, did that life evolve on Mars? What characteristics did it have? How does it compare to life here on Earth? And how can we learn learn from that? So I think it's an imperative for humans to move beyond this planet. I, I think sometimes we do it robotically with New Horizons, uh, and sometimes, like with our astronauts every day up on the International Space Station, we do it with people. Dan, thank you very much for your call. We're going to take a short break. I'm glad you introduced the conversation about alien life, because that's what we're going to talk about when we come back. You can call us with your questions or comments for Ellen Stofan. She is Chief Scientist at NASA, 800-433-8850. Do you believe that we will find alien life forms in the near future? You can also go to our website, kojoshow.org, watch the live video stream, or send us a tweet at kojoshow. Email is kojo.wmu.org. I'm Kojo Namdi.
Welcome back. Our guest is Ellen Stofan. She is chief scientist at NASA. We're talking on Tech Tuesday. You got a lot of attention earlier this year when you said that you believe that we will find proof of alien life by the year 2025. What gives you the confidence that we are on the verge of making this kind of discovery? Well, actually what I said was that um, in the next 10 years, we would get strong indications of life beyond the Earth. So that's not definitive proof, which I said I thought would take more on the order of 20 years. One of the things that's made us so confident that there's life beyond Earth is the fact that water is so ubiquitous in our solar system. And, and based on what we know about how life evolved here on Earth, it evolved in water, but we think also there's properties of the water molecule that make it ideal for um, for uh, and necessary for the formation of life. It's a solvent, it's got the unique um, properties with its charges. So we think water is really critical. So as we go out into the solar system, we look for places where we say, where was water or where is water stable for long periods of time? Because there's also that time element to give, give life a chance to evolve. But keep in mind that after conditions, the Earth formed about 4.6 billion years ago and things were kind of crazy here on Earth for a while. Um, by the time conditions had stabilized, within a couple hundred million years, life had evolved. Very simple forms, microbes stayed that way for a long time, stayed in the oceans for a long time. So we look out into the solar system and we say, where could we go? And that's why Mars is such an, an obvious choice. We know that there were probably oceans at the North Pole of Mars, maybe for as long as a billion years. Jupiter's moon Europa has an icy crust. Underneath that icy crust is a liquid water ocean that has probably persisted for billions of years. Uh, we look out into the solar system. We know that from studying things like comets, even looking in interstellar clouds, there are complex organic uh, molecules um, that are the building blocks of life. Those are all over the place. So if you have the basic building blocks of life all over the place, you have lots of places where, where liquid water is, is um, present. We now have the technology to go measure these things. We know where to go. We know what to measure. And then on top of that, we have the fact that, you know, talking about Pluto, how many planets there are. You know, back when I was in school, we, we well, okay, we had Pluto. We had nine planets. We now have thousands of planets because we have identified so many planets around other stars, especially with our Kepler Space Telescope over the last several years. We're starting with our James Webb Space Telescope in 2018 to look at the atmospheres of those planets around other stars. And obviously we're looking for that Earth-like world. We're looking for a planet that has water in its atmosphere, gases like methane, carbon dioxide, that would say, okay, this planet is potentially habitable. And then we're going to start looking for potential signs of life. So all this is happening at such an exciting time right now, and it really puts us on the verge of these big discoveries. When you say potential signs of life, I have to say you've said this is more a matter of little green microbes than little green men. <laughs> That's right. And I think people do have this, you know, they, they want, you know, they're so used to science fiction movies or whatever, and they're expecting really complex life forms like us. But um to be honest with you, the scientific community is thinking things you need to look at with a microscope, not as exciting, exciting to us. On to Paul in Reston, Virginia. Paul, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. So, hi. Um, I was just wondering why planets that are made of gas like Jupiter and Saturn are considered planets. I think it's planets being like um, solid material. So could you just explain why gas planets are planets? That's a great question because we call them gas giants, but they actually do have solid surfaces. They're just buried under a big giant atmosphere. So even the, the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they do have solid surfaces. They're just at the base of a very, very thick atmosphere. What's cool about those planets in the outer solar system is they actually have little worlds around them. They have many, many satellites that are complex planets in their own right. Um, again, my favorite is Titan, which is one of the moons of Saturn, which has an atmosphere, um, dominantly nitrogen, but it actually may, rains methane and ethane on Titan to form seas. So well, these gas giants are planets, but they also have almost little planetary systems around them that we love to study. Thank you very much for your call. We move on to Peter in Springfield, Virginia. Peter, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. So my question really follows on your last comment about finding life on other planets in 20 years or so. Why are we narrowly uh, talking about the availability of water? I would think there's got to be a lot of alien life that doesn't uh, know what water is and could care less. <laughs> 
that you know that's a great question and it's certainly something that the scientific community um really debates about because again we think that water has these unique properties that other liquids don't have um but to go back to titan for a second um titan has these seas of methane and ethane so liquid but not water um, and that's one of the reasons, ultimately, we want to go explore those seas, because we want to really say, what are the limits to life? Okay, we know water is important. We know life can form in water. But what about in liquid methane and ethane? What about other liquids? What about in the sulfur clouds of Venus? So every time we've really thought something based on what we know about the Earth, when we've moved out into the solar system, into the universe, we've found that we only have a small picture of, of what is. And so I agree with you. I think there's great potential um, for other kinds of life that hopefully we'll be finding over the next, you know, 50 years or so. But we do know that water is important. Yes. So we go with what we know. And what missions in the near future do you see the most potential to make these kinds of discoveries? The next Mars rover is scheduled to launch in 2020. That's a mission we're really excited about. It's got a number of instruments on board. We're certainly going to be looking for signs of ancient microbial life. That doesn't mean we're going to find it. Um, but one of the things that the scientific community is already coming together to talk about landing sites um, for that rover. So looking with all of the other data sets that we have, especially from our orbiting spacecraft, where are the places, especially based on what we've learned from our Curiosity rover, where are the best places to go on Mars that have the highest potential for life? So that's something, that's a mission we're definitely excited about. The other thing we're excited about is a new mission to Europa that we're going to fly in the 2020s. Um, there's been some indication that there might be plumes of, of water erupting from uh, Europa's oceans out so that we could fly a spacecraft through those plumes and maybe get a sample of Euro Europa's ocean and try to understand what's maybe inside of Europa. Um, so those are two missions right there that, that I think have a lot of potential. What hopes do you have for human exploration of Mars and what do you hope we could learn from it? You know, I'm really optimistic that we can get humans to Mars in the 2030s. Uh, again, we're, we're building our rocket system to get there. We, every day up on the International Space Station, we're doing uh, uh, work uh, with humans to mitigate the effects of microgravity. You know, living in space is hard, and, and your body actually doesn't take it too well. Your bones lose density, your muscles start wasting. So on the ISS, we are working on mitigations, ways to uh, reduce these effects so that we could have astronauts stay healthy uh, for long periods of time in space. In fact, our one-year mission that we've embarked on with astronaut Scott Kelly, um, turning it into a twin study with his brother Mark Kelly, um, is part of this whole how do we get humans uh, to Mars in the 2030s, get them there healthy, be able to bring them back home again. So we're on that path. And again, scientifically, I want to see scientists on Mars, you know, picking up rocks, cracking them open, looking for those microbe fossils. Well, I'd like to know where you get this idea from. You're bullish on the idea of exploring the moon called Titan. This is the only other place known to have liquid on its surface. You developed this concept for sending a boat or a lake lander there. What draws you so strongly to Titan? And how did you develop the lake lander concept? Well, you know, I'm, I'm really consider myself an Earth geologist. And so when I study Venus or I study Mars or I study Titan, I'm really trying to say, what are the places I can go in the solar system to learn something more about the Earth? When we go out to Titan, you know, 90 million miles um, from Earth, you've got a place where it rains. There are seas on the surface. So romantic on some level, <laughs> but just an amazing thing. It's the only other place in the solar system with uh, open bodies of liquid. The only other place we could go to understand how does a sea interact with an atmosphere? Um, how does a liquid cycle, like our hydrologic cycle, work with a different fluid? So such an amazing place that you could go so far out in the solar system, different materials, but the same processes that are occurring here on Earth. So we thought, all right, let's go try to study. Um, and we put together, uh, with a team of, of great people, we put together an idea to splash down a little probe. It would float around for about uh, three months. Uh, taking data and measuring what those seas were made of. Uh, we made it through the first stage of a NASA competition. We ultimately didn't get selected. But, um, you know, someday we will explore those seas because, again, I think they have part of this answer to, to this question of how important is liquid water to life. What has to happen for uh, a mission like that to move forward? 
you know, there's a lot of competition um, because there's so many destinations in the solar system um, and the scientific community gets together and lays out priorities through something we call the decadal surveys, which is done through the National Academy of Science. And we lay out what are the what are the top goals for science over the next 10 years? Um, and, and so, first of all, you have to have you have to have good enough science that your colleagues all will say, yes, this is this is worth, you know, NASA investing money in. And then you have to technically show, you know, we're capable of doing this exploration. So it's always a big competition. Um, there's lots of destinations. There's lots of great things to go measure. We got an email from Alan who says, will the New Horizons spacecraft continue to send back messages long after it passes Pluto? Voyager still continued for years or decades sending back signals. Will this do the same? New Horizons will um, keep sending back data. In fact, all the great data from this encounter that occurred um, this morning, um, it'll take us a while to send all that data back. We, we took so much data this morning that we will keep sending it back for months. So just keep your seatbelt fastened for just an amazing series of, of images to come back of Pluto and its, its little moons. Um, and then hopefully, um, we're hoping to continue the New Horizon mission for several more years out into the Kuiper Belt hopefully finding another Kuiper Belt um, object to image, but we'll we'll see how that goes. Space exploration gives us a window into things that have happened in the universe billions of years ago. What are you aiming to get out of the Dawn spacecraft project? This has already explored the asteroid Vesta and it arrived at the dwarf planet Ceres a few months ago. You know, asteroids, um, are the building blocks of the planets. So there, it's basically material that was left over when all the planets in the solar system formed about 4.6 billion years ago. Um, the Kuiper Belt also preserves some of that very, very early material. So again, Pluto is kind of some of the oldest material in the solar system is what, what makes up Pluto. So whether you're studying Ceres or Vesta or Pluto or whether the European Rosetta mission, which is studying a comet right now, all of that stuff is the stuff that Earth is made of. And so we really, these missions are so important from going and saying, what are the basic building blocks that made our planet? And, and I tell you, there's really fundamental questions, like where did the water on Earth come from? Did it come from comets? Did it come from asteroids? These are questions we don't have the answer to. And by going out and visiting these different worlds around, around our solar system, we're able to start answering some of those fundamental questions. I had some budget related questions, but then so do members of our listening audience. So I'll start with Shelley in Annandale, Virginia. Shelley, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Thank you. This is a wonderful program. Uh, my question is, you mentioned that the president uh, wants NASA to go to Mars, but you're talking about 2030, I believe. How do you maintain a budget? How do you know that you'll have enough money to do that with different administrations coming in to the White House as well as Congress? And please also tell us how we can invite you to speak at a school, because I teach at an elementary school and I teach science. Thank you. Thank you very much for your call. First, budget. Um, you know, when, um, when you look at, at NASA, which is, um, you know, sometimes I refer to us as the keepers of the future, you know, we're, we're always looking 10, 20 years at least out into the future. Where are we going? How can we explore? Um, and, and we live in a world, especially in a town, that functions on a much shorter time frame. Uh, and so it's really on, on NASA working um, with our partners in, in Congress, with our, our partners in the White House, to lay out a compelling plan that's, that's a strategy for exploration that is good for the nation. Uh, when you invest money in NASA, you return at least uh, $4 for every dollar you invest in, in NASA back to the U.S. economy. These are, are, are great STEM jobs that, that employ and, and energize our workforce. NASA spinoffs are too numerous to even go into. So I think NASA just always has to make the case, and we've done it very successfully over our history, of laying out a compelling vision uh, of exploration that, that as we go through multiple administrations, uh, we can bring the American people and bring our stakeholders uh, along with us. And I love your question about going into schools because um, I try to go to at least two or three schools um, a month. I feel like one school at a time showing that women can be scientists and do cool things is important. And so I love to go and chat with schools. Speaking of schools, we got an email from Shelley who writes, I teach science in Spanish at the elementary level and I'm very 
excited to teach the new knowledge NASA is learning about Pluto. I frequent and use the NASA Kids website. Will updates concerning Pluto be available before the start of the new school year? Also, kudos to NASA for translating your kids' site into Spanish. We are constantly having to update our website with our new findings um, from Pluto. They will be, and we will certainly be doing that for uh, the new data we're getting every day from Ceres, another exciting mission. Um, let alone if we step back and look at all the data coming from our 22 satellites in orbit around this planet, uh, trying to understand how this planet works and how it's changing. So yeah, we, we take uh, our role in inspiring uh, kids very seriously uh, in STEM and also in providing materials that are hopefully useful to teachers. So it's really great to hear that we're hitting the mark. More specifically on the budget, the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology introduced a new two-year NASA authorization bill this past April, and it's made some serious changes in NASA's budget. Um, for instance, how has NASA been dealing with the cuts to Earth Science divisions? You know, NASA's Earth Science, which is an extremely strong program, which I mentioned our, our 22 satellites uh, studying this planet. We live on an extremely complicated planet. Uh, our atmosphere, the surface, the interior, how these things all interact, how our climate is changing. It's from the unique perspective of space. Um, is so necessary for really understanding this planet and only NASA can provide that unique perspective. Uh, we develop technologies that, that help us not only understand how our climate is changing, but are actually helping farmers uh, use less water, helping them understand how to water their crops. Uh, we provide data to help people around the world in crises to help things like where's the next potential landslide going to be. Um, our earth science data is critical. And so, um, frankly, these cuts are something we're extremely concerned about. Uh, we're hoping they don't all come through because our earth science program uh, is something we're extremely proud of and we think is critical to uh, the health of this country. To what degree have budget constraints already forced you to reprioritize when it comes to research and your scientific agenda? No, when it comes to prioritizing science, again, we really look to the National Academy. And what you do is you sort of look through what the priorities of the science community is set, and you say, given the, the restricted budget we have, you know, what can we do and not do? And, and right now, you just keep trying to stretch the money you have to make sure that you are doing the research that's necessary, making the measurements that are required uh, to really move the country forward. Got to take a short break. If you have called, stay on the line. If you'd like to call, the number is 800-433-8850 for this Tech Tuesday conversation with Ellen Stofan, Chief Scientist at NASA. What, what questions do you have about NASA's plans for further discoveries? What do you hope NASA will focus its attention on next? 800-433-8850. Go to our website kojoshow.org, watch the live video stream, ask a question, make a comment, or send us an email to kojowamu.org. I'm Kojo Nandi. Coming up at one, the lingering effects of a horrific chapter in Indonesia's history, Oscar-nominated director Joshua Oppenheimer on his latest documentary, The Look of Silence. Plus, it's your turn to set the agenda, the data breach at the Office of Personnel Management, or the controversy around Harper Lee's newly published novel, Go Set a Watchman. Today at 1 on the Kojo Nandi Show on WAMU 88.5 and streaming at kojoshow.org.
Welcome back. It's Tech Tuesday, and we're talking with Ellen Stoffen. She is Chief Scientist at NASA and taking your calls at 800-433-8850. Let's talk secrets with Daniel in Washington, D.C. Daniel, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi. How y'all doing today? Doing well. Good. And how about you, doctor? I'm doing great. Great. Well, my question is for you, doctor, and it's regarding, you mentioned a little bit how you work with the White House and how you have this partnership with them. Uh, I was wondering if you had an agreement with them that says if you do come across intelligent life forms, that you are bound to keep it secret and not inform anyone about it. Um, you know, certainly not. We we at NASA share all of our data. It's All NASA data is available to the public on our websites, um, and we try to release our data the minute we get it back and know that it's okay. We get it right there out there on our websites. You know, if we actually found evidence of alien life, there'd be nobody more excited about it and wanting to talk about it than those of us at NASA because we'd have so many follow-on questions. You know, what are what's the exact form of this life? Does it have cell membranes? Does it have RNA and DNA? How does it compare? So much to learn, and we'd want to bring the whole world and the whole scientific community along with us. Daniel, what would you see as the motivation for keeping it secret? Well, certainly, um, you know, if there was uh, discovered to be intelligent life form, uh, you could see how people might react to that, potentially. And certainly the government's job is to keep people comfortable and, and uh, you know, secure. You mean so, people might yeah. react in fear under the assumption that this life form, this intelligent life form, would be hostile to us? Well, yeah, sure. Certainly some people might think it's the doomsday, you know. I wouldn't think that. I don't know why people would think that, but certainly some people could and might think that it would be the doomsday. It's the prophecy of X, Y, or Z book, sure. Gotcha. Well, you know, I have to say one of the things, we're not really worried about angry microbes, but one of the one of the things that we are really careful about and take extremely seriously is planetary protection. And that is the concept that we are very careful not to contaminate worlds. We are going to go explore where we think there's the potential for life. We make sure our spacecraft are as clean as possible because we don't want to go to that planet and say, oh, look, we found life. Oops, we brought it with us. <laughs> so that's one aspect of planetary protection. And the other is we don't want to contaminate the Earth potentially with any life microbes, again, that we might bring back from somewhere else. So when we think about sample return missions, we are very careful to say, does this place have any potential for life? And let's make sure that, that we would really keep the sample away from humans until we knew it was safe. NASA has several women in senior positions of the organization. This is not typical for most STEM fields. What do you think it is about NASA that differs from other organizations where the glass ceiling, if you will, the gender barrier may be more prevalent? You know, NASA's made a real effort to try to find the best talent who can do the best job, but we also extremely, extremely value di diversity. When you're trying to work on really tough planets, whether it's addressing climate change here on this planet, whether it's landing humans on the surface of Mars, you need all hands on deck. You need the best talent uh, from from this country. And, and so it's very important for us to say, if we're only choosing the best STEM talent from a small portion of the population, um, we're not, we're not going to get the best talent. So we need to reach out to women. We need to reach out to other underrepresented groups who maybe haven't felt like they were welcome or that they always belonged. And so I think at NASA, starting with our administrator at the top, Charlie Bolden, you know, we really have um, continue always to strive to make sure that we have a diverse and welcoming community. And again, this isn't for the sake of just saying, oh, we need to count numbers and, and have people there for the, the heck of it. It's because we need the best talent. We need diverse points of view to solve these tough challenges we have in front of us. And apart from your actually going to elementary schools, the importance of which cannot be understated because I think images are very important for young people to see. What do you feel are the most important things that can happen that will inspire more women to pursue science, math, technology, or engineering? Well, you know, I do think that role model is important because if you're not in a place where you you feel there are people like you, when you look around a room and count and say, wow, I'm the only one who looks like me in this room, you feel uncomfortable. And, and that means maybe you're not going to stay. So we look at it at NASA, and I, I think the community of women scientists around the world, we're really working on how can we attack all the different pieces of this pipeline where we're losing women and other underrepresented groups. You know, all kids in third or fourth grade are enthused about science and dinosaurs and volcanoes and Pluto. 
but we lose kids in middle school. Um, and, and why? And, and in different groups are the reasons always the same. We lose kids in high school. We lose women in college, especially in engineering and computer science programs. And I will say, if you look at college faculty, for example, women still make up less than a quarter of um, STEM field professors. So, so, you know, that's an issue. And then once women get in the workforce, how do you make sure once we have women in, for example, the federal STEM workforce, that they feel valued, that they feel comfortable, um, that they're not intimidated by the fact that a lot of the times they are the only person like them in the room. A recent article at Fast Company suggested that it's not a coincidence that more women are rising up as NASA as open data has taken on more importance. What do you make of that? Well, you know, again, I, I, I think it's, it's interesting when you think of things like unconscious bias that, that affect how people treat each other. When you think of things like open data and open environments, it's the best people doing the best work that are rising to the top. In a lot of cases, that's women. Um, it's on people from underrepresented groups. And so I think when you have free access to data, open data, you get more people involved, you create a welcoming uh, environment for kids, like with the Girls Who Code, Black Girls Who Code programs, you make women feel, you can do this, you are welcome, come be part of our community. Those programs really start to make a difference. I don't know how personal friends creep into this conversation. We got a, we got a tweet from Tracy who says, congrats to former Rooney, <laughs> Ellen Stoffen for Kojo Show interview. Space I love rocks. her. Hey, Tracy. <laughs> Tracy Baynard. <laughs> is your former roommate? Yeah, yeah, from college. Oh. Love her. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Tracy. Glad we could keep you in touch. Okay. We move on now to Catherine in Herndon, Virginia. Catherine, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, Kojo. Good afternoon. Um, and good afternoon to your guest. Um, my question was about what um, your guest said earlier about it being an imperative to explore space in terms of getting boots on the ground on other surfaces. Um, I actually was wanting um, to hear an expansion of that idea just because I, I'm a little skeptical of why it is an imperative. Apart from motivating school children, it certainly is that. But would you be able to explain why it's an imperative? Yeah, you know, when I when I look at our Opportunity rover on Mars, and it's an amazing little plucky rover, you know, it was supposed to last about nine months, it's now been 11 years. Um, it's done amazing science. In 11 years, it's gone 26 miles. You or I could go 26 miles, well, I can't run a marathon, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put a time limit on it, but face it, humans can cover so much more ground. We are creative, we are flexible, and you know, I've had people argue with me, well, we can make robots do that. Well, I would argue it's more efficient to just send humans who are creative, who are flexible, who can move around, who can cover great distances much better than a robot can and who can make decisions about when they see something. Okay, now I know to go do this without having that delayed time of getting a command from Earth. Um, humans are are amazing creatures and I think we belong exploring and we will change how Mars is explored and change what we can learn about that red planet in a way that years and years of robotic missions just could not do. Thank you very much for your call. We got an email from Jay who says, when we hear about, no, I'm sorry, an email from Julie who says, I just wish the space program would take a break. We put billions into the program, which seems mostly to satisfy our curiosity. We could use this money here on our planet, especially in the green energy programs, which brings me to this question. Space is NASA's bread and butter, but so many of the technologies it has helped to develop can be seen in our daily lives now. Can you tell us about some of the ways that NASA's spin-off technology is being used today so that we don't think it's just satisfying our curiosity? Yeah, and I will say, you know, my favorite Onion cartoon ever, Onion article, was this this cartoon that showed a spacecraft being launched into space with money trailing behind it, and it says, you know, NASA launches a billion dollars into space. Obviously, you know, we don't launch money into space. We hire um, people all around this country in small companies to large companies to at our NASA centers. Um, so that money that's being spent at NASA is being invested in the U.S. economy. And again, as, as you say, Kojo, just returns so much to this economy in, in the form of not just scientific knowledge, which is what I care about, but also in practical spinoffs. You know, things ranging from new materials to 
ear thermometers to techniques. One of our radar techniques that we use on planets, we've, we've actually adapted to now use to search for earthquake victims. It was just used successfully in Kathmandu. Um, to the data, again, that we return, the earth science data that we've returned that helps us now understand our weather and our climate in ways uh, that we didn't that are helping us move forward. Uh, for example, in California, where we have had a pilot program that is helping farmers to use about 30% la less water, uh, which is obviously so critical in that state right now that's undergoing such a drought. Um, so, so from the technology spinoffs to the practical uses of our data, not just here, but around the world, uh, we feel that investing in NASA is, is good for this country. On to Butch in Alexandria, Virginia. Butch, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Oh, thank you, Kojo. And hello, Aaron. I had a question. I was watching a video on the web uh, a couple months back, and it showed uh, a balloon or a blimp dirigible type device being deployed as, a, as this spacecraft entered the Venus atmosphere, and that uh, people arrived after it successfully deployed, and they were um, supposed to be riding around in it, I guess, to do further ex human exploration of Venus at the high altitude level. Can you talk a little more about that and uh, where it might be as far as getting funded and actually happening? Well, you know, Venus is near and dear to my heart. It, it's a planet I worked on for a long time. It's uh, got a greenhouse atmosphere. It's 900 degrees Fahrenheit on, on the surface, but it's about the same size as the Earth and made of about the same material. So we often talk about it as our our twin sister gone wrong, our evil twin sister. So studying that planet is, is fascinating. I actually don't think it's a great target for future human exploration because of the fact that the conditions on the surface are so hostile. And also as you move towards the sun, um, it obviously gets warmer, so you have to do a lot to your spacecraft to protect it from those thermal conditions. But um, you're very right that in the higher levels of Venus, um, the higher levels of the Venus atmosphere, the temperatures are, are much more benign. and, and uh, Colleagues of mine have even suggested maybe there could be some kind of microbes living in the clouds of Venus. Um, I'm not sure about that, but maybe. So Venus is a place that it really is an intriguing object for future exploration, but probably robotically, and the use potentially of bloom, balloons or blimps that could explore the Venus atmosphere is something the science community has taken quite a close look at. On to Dylan in Washington. Dylan, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, Kojo. Uh, and I guess um, my name is Dylan. I was wondering uh, more about Pluto. So the spacecraft that's shooting by, to my knowledge, we're only going to have about like 30 minutes of really high quality photos. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, we go by very quickly, 31,000 miles an hour, and we snap as many pictures, take as much data as we can coming in and then turning around and going out, which is why we're not talking to the spacecraft right now, because the spacecraft's still taking data. Uh, oh, so I was wondering why doesn't the spacecraft, why don't we do whatever would need to be done to have it enter Pluto's orbit or something like that? So that's going to take a lot more photos or is that just not possible? Or it, It's really not possible because when you think about it, um, it took us nine and a half years to get there and we're now going 31,000 miles an hour. And so frankly, to slow the spacecraft down enough to safely go into orbit around such a small body is something that technically is just too much of a challenge. And so a flyby mission really gets you a huge amount of science. It gets the science that we need to really do reconnaissance of this body and try to understand it um, without ever having to try to slow down. And again, if we went any slower getting there, I wouldn't be here today talking because it would take be we'd still be a long way from Pluto. So it already took nine and a half years to get there. So a flyby really gives us the science that we need. And so again, right now the spacecraft is still taking data. In a little bit, it'll finally turn towards the Earth and say, hey, I made it safely through the system and, and slowly start sending that data back. And I urge you around, starting around maybe 8, 15, 8, 20 tonight, turn into NASA TV if you can. But if you're not, if you're on the computer, go to a site called eyes.jpl.nasa.gov. It actually shows our different antenna. And you can see which spacecraft they're talking to. It's a great nerd fun site to look at if you're ever bored and you're like, I wonder what the Goldstone antenna in California who is it talking to? Um, look, and all of a sudden you'll see eventually a link up with the New Horizons spacecraft, and that link up will tell us that, that, that New Horizons has made it safely past Pluto and is ready to start sending us back data. Dylan, thank you very much for your call. We have less than a minute left, but in what ways do you consider your job as one where you're an ambassador for science more broadly, not just for NASA? 
you know, the science we do at NASA is so amazing, but I feel I represent not just NASA, but the international community of scientists who are really trying to understand this planet. Um, what is the fate and future of the Earth? How, by studying other planets, by studying planets around other worlds, can we really understand our own planet better? And then how can we harness what we do at NASA, what we do with our international partners, what we do partnering with commercial industry to move humans beyond this planet and onto the surface of Mars. So it's an incredibly exciting time, incredibly exciting position to be in. Ellen Stoffen, she is Chief Scientist at NASA. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. I'm Kojo Nambi. <laughs>
From WAMU 88.